All right, very good. We're going to get started up again here. Um, uh, so it's it's my pleasure to introduce Eric Verboon, who is co-founder and managing director of Walter P. Moore's New York office. Eric trained both in architecture and engineering and brings a deep global experience with a focus on the design of complex and high performance building envelopes for a wide uh, range of building types. He also has experience working, working with a wide variety of facade applications including high performance, double skin facades, geometrically complex composite facades, and custom unitized enclosures for both new buildings and existing building retrofits and additions. Eric is also a longtime supporter of ATAL and uh, being part of the workshop since its inception. We're also joined by uh, Roberto Vicciarelli, uh, who is uh, the business development manager and lead concept designer at Permis de Lisa in North America. Uh, Roberto graduated from the University of Rome, La, La Sapienza, with a degree in architecture. In addition to his general manager roles, Roberto oversees sales and estimating concentrating on southern U.S. and the Central and South American markets, while still maintaining a close relationship with many of his former projects. From early 2017, uh, Roberto covered the role of lead concept designer, and from June 2018, also the role of business development manager. Uh, at, on uh, off the East Coast. Currently, he's working for Gartner USA, a division of Firmus Delisa, North America. So please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Eric Verboon and Roberto Bicciarelli. Thanks, Omar. I'm just going to bring up my slides. And let me know if everybody can see it. Are you able to see it, Elmar? Everybody? Good? All right, great. Let's, let's go. Fantastic. Well, thank you, everybody, uh, for having me. Um, uh, and uh, I want to first start by, by saying thank you to Boston Valley Terracotta, University of Buffalo, um, John Kraus, Mitch Omar, Andy Brayman, um, as well as uh, colleagues and, and the architectural teams that we were able to collaborate with this, uh, with, with, uh, this year and, and prior years. Um, as Omar mentioned, we've been involved with uh, ACOL since the first event, and we're proud to this year be sponsors of it. So um, um, uh, I'm excited for everybody to see the kind of exciting work that uh, we presented in the next couple of days or next day or so to uh, of, of the various teams we we're involved with. Um, so we're, we're talking about, Roberto and I are talking about um, sort of evolutions in, in, uh, in terracotta cladding. And, you know, I don't want to dwell too far on uh, or too much on the history of uh, of terracotta uh, as a as a cladding element or a or an architectural element, but only so far to say um, a brief intro uh, to to where we are today. Um, you know, our terracotta has been used in architectural applications since since antiquity, um, but its applications in the early stages were limited to smaller elements such as floors and roof tiles, ornate detailing, and then. The first mass-produced terracotta, you know, um, for use in enclosure elements, began in uh, in the UK um, in the mid to late 1800s, uh, or in England in the mid to late 1800s. Um, simultaneously, the US saw um, uh, a rise of uh, a few small ceramic fabricators, um, but the US was still supplying a lot of their um, material from from Europe. Um, and then, as a reaction to the Chicago Fire um, in 1871, terra terracotta gained popularity as a fireproofing material, um, uh, and um, its growing use as a as a cladding element, um, as a as a replication or replacement for stone, quickly gained, gained hold. Um, you can see sort of early applications here, or early early um, drawing of um, the construction principles behind terracotta as a cladding element. Um, where um, primarily it was still being used in a, in a load-bearing capacity. Um, and uh, although it was being applied to a, a structural masonry backup wall. Those principles, um, you know, uh, haven't really changed much today in the, in the sense of traditional terracotta um, detailing. Um, however, what we do now is we, we separate the sort of layers. So we have multiple lines of defense from, from water infiltration, moisture, um, uh, moisture barriers, as well as, um, as well as insulation. So, but what you see here is, is, is fairly, a fairly similar approach and, and things haven't changed, but 
But what you know, I want to dwell on, you know, and I think this actually is is a is an example of a project that was recently completed by Boston Valley Terracotta um, uh, by Roman and Williams and and uh, uh, for JDS development, and one that you know utilizes those principles. But you know, what I want to focus on today is a little bit more of the maybe more contemporary approaches to rain screen cladding and uh, ones that um, utilize a, a rain screen type approach um, or derivations of a rain screen approach. Um, you know, as an interest, um, with an interest in kind of the, the growing um, cavity, cavity wall construction, um, terracotta rain screens have been um, seen as, as an innovative approach to, um, uh, to a cladding system that dealt with um, or addressed a lot of the sort of shortfalls that we saw in the traditional sort of handset terracotta techniques um, that dealt with the water penetration and anchor corrosion that we typically saw. Um, and, you know, while the first installations of, of terracotta rain screens were, um, I think, I believe in Germany um, in the 1980s, early 1980s, um, uh, the first introduction of um, terracotta and rain screens um, uh, were, were uh, you know, primarily um, through the work of, um, that you can see here, um, at least my first introduction of rain screen cladding um, in, in Germany in Potsdamer Platz here. So you can see it getting a foothold um, uh, quite quite prevalently uh, across the across the world. And um, while most of them were straightforward in geometry, utilizing standard kind of extrusion techniques for cladding panels, um, you know, we start to see a little more inventiveness happening uh, as years go on. And here we see a project from 2015 that Boston Valley Terracotta um, um, supplied the terracotta for, uh, for the Center of Asian Arts um, at the uh, John and Mabel Ringling Museum. And where, you know, it was a more exploratory process um, uh, for the, the, the development of the, of a unique um, cladding system. And uh, from what I understand, this project um, was, was sort of the catalyst for the ACOL event. Um, in looking at more inventive ways to, uh, to use the, the ceramic material, to use the terracotta material um, in architectural applications. So what is evolving? And um, I'm going to go through, um, you know, through the context of um, discussing these, these uh, evolving strategies. I wanted to talk a little bit about projects that I was involved with um, um, over the course of my career. Um, uh, surprisingly, um, most of them with Boston Valley Terracotta, um, which was, which is a great experience. Um, and, you know, uh, what I, you know, uh, observed as far as what was changing, uh, as a, uh, as far as cladding is concerned, cladding technology, what is evolving. Um, and as, uh, as, you know, uh, and, and that primarily revolved around the, the issues of form and function. So um, as well as the as the sort of um, collaborative nature in which um, we work with um, Boston Valley Terracotta and other and other um, suppliers to create these these uh, unique um, enclosure and cladding systems. So I'm going to take you um, you know through um, what I understood in my career as sort of the evolution of cladding um, and take you down a little bit of memory lane of my first um, sort of. Uh, um, uh, project where I had the, uh, the fortune of working with Boston Valley Terracotta, um, all the way to a uh, current project that my office is currently working on. Um, the first project is um, uh, East, 6G, East 6J Street Townhouse with Michael uh, K. Chen Architects. Um, this one um, was uh, was uh, a project in the, in the uh, Upper East Side of Manhattan. The second is uh, 512 West 22nd Street, an office building um, in New York City along the High Line with Cook Fox Architects. Um, and the third is the Orange County Museum of Art that we're currently working on with, with Morphosis. Um, and full disclosure, um, you know, the first two projects that, I've, that I'm presenting here um, were ones that I worked on uh, my previous uh, employer, uh, Bureau Happold. So I wanted to give full uh, credit and kudos to, to that team um, uh, for, the, for, the, for the work that they performed on that project and those projects. And completing those projects. So I'll start with the um, 68th Street townhouse. And, um, you know, this was a really a fantastic um, showcase of, of, uh, of the kind of advances in, in, in the production and the design of terracotta um, in a number of numerous applications. Um, in 2012, Michael Chen um, uh, received the commission to design and, uh, and renovate uh, and restore a stately, um, a significantly degraded uh, five story townhouse. Um, that was built in 19, oh, sorry, 1879 um, in a neo-Greco neo, neo -Greco style. 
Um, and, you know, what we see here in these diagrams is that there is, you know, um, two, two primary facades, um, one street facing and one in the rear courtyard. And both of those facades um, uh, utilized um, uh, the, the Boston Valley terracotta systems. The front facade, um, which I'm not going to dwell upon because it's it's not necessarily utilizing the um, uh, sort of the, the, the more experimental um, terracotta systems that we approach uh, that we that we that we uh, are talking about a lot in these uh, conferences, um, is you know one where the facade um, uh, existing facade was a was a, a severely deteriorating painted brownstone, um, and uh, that was completely stripped off and replaced with uh, with the Boston Valley terracotta cladding. Um, uh, in a kind of traditionally handset manner. Um, so um, what you can see here is just the, the, the sort of um, the nature of the, of the extrusions, um, the sort of laying out of the, uh, of the um, um, uh, laying out of the, of, the, of the pieces on the floor, and then the final installation um, that we see uh, in the field. The, the the real exciting parts, though, for me on this project were, was the rear facades, where we um, experimented with the development of two uh, two primary facade systems. Um, one was the what you see in the sort of white or gray, which is a extruded terracotta rain screen system, and then what you see um, uh, in the diagram on the lower hand side, lower left hand side which was essentially a slip cast terracotta planter wall. And I'm gonna get into uh, describing those things in a little more detail. The uh, extruded rain screen system consisted of a um, singular um, extrusion type um, that, was, that was extruded in the, in the, in the plant, in, in Boston Valley Terracotta's plant. And then um, that would ultimately be modified um, in a post-processing technique to get uh, a modifying sort of uh, profile along the length of the facade. You can see here in plan how the depth of the, of the extrusion changes as along the length, where on the right side, it would be the original extrusion, and on the left side, it actually is, a, is the fully modified cut extrusion. You can see here in an image the kind of um, effect that you get by um, the, 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 the maximum depth extrusion sort of gently tapering off into a, a flat panel. And you can see here that the, the, the general technique for the uh, detailing and the, and the support um, structure for the, these systems utilized a fairly conventional approach uh, for terracotta rain screen systems. We didn't deviate too much from um, the standard um, clip hanging system that Boston Valley provides. But this diagram explains the process for um, forming those pieces. What we see here is the uh, is the die um, and the extrusion process where these these two fin um, this two fin extrusion comes out and that that extrusion is then uh, divided into smaller pieces and then post processed by slicing the, the tip of that fin at various depths. We experimented that with with Boston Valley in their plant in this technique where they um, utilized essentially a hand a hand uh, made jig that would allow you to um, slide a wire cutter um, along the face of the profile to then create those cuts in that profile and, and the profile desired. Um, what you'll, if you ever made a trip to Boston Valley um, uh, uh, recently, you'll, you might have noticed a, a piece of equipment that they've, um, that they've created, which is a robotically controlled uh, CNC wire cutter, which was really inspired by this project. Um, because of the sort of um, the, the speed and the accuracy that it, it could uh, it could offer, um, as opposed to the hand hand uh, hand cutting technique um, in this in the pro in using this process and this project. But here you can see some some finished images. They, they it's it's amazing how closely it resembles the the rendering, but you can see how um, that those profiles um, were were sort of tapering gently towards the center. Um, and uh, and created a very nice nice process of uh, of uh, uh, or a nice nice effect with the glaze as well, where the, the glaze broke differently across each profile, creating different textures and tones across the entire entire facade. The next project I'm going to talk about, or next next uh, um, piece on this facade I'm going to talk about is the is the green wall, where essentially it was a, a, a the green wall was designed as a series of slip cast um, terracotta vessels that would house plantings. 
and the design for those those vessels and the depth of those vessels and where plantings would be um, derived or, or located was um, was driven by the solar analysis performed in that on that east facing uh, facade uh, uh, area. So um, the shadow was studied, and that drove where where planters would be located, as opposed to areas that were not planters. And then those planters would be fed with uh, with internal sort of uh, piping that would that would feed the the water to the various plants. And you can see here the process and the various initial models of how those vessels um, uh, held the plants and how those how those vessels were created using a slip cast method. So essentially, you have the the slip casting mold, um, and then the as as uh, uh, Bill had mentioned um, in his presentation, um, uh, the process by pouring. Uh, the, the the terracotta product into the into the mold, spinning it, and then ultimately releasing it from the mold, which you can see in this process here. So you can see the various mold elements that were um, that were generated, um, and then um, uh, and then formed into the um, into the into the actual um, um, gypsum mold. And then once removed, you can see the unearthing process here of 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 taking out that those finished pieces, and then ultimately um, cutting it. Um, with a knife to reveal the sort of um, open um, sort of uh, cavity of that of those planter pieces that would ultimately receive the plantings themselves. So you can see here um, the, the finished product where um, the plantings um, sort of are arrayed um, uh, over the over the area of the uh, of the facade system um, and does a very good job at uh, at supporting growth um, uh, for those plants. Um, and you know what what this what this highlights is that you know as opposed to just a cladding element um, that uh, that uh, you know creates an architectural effect, um, we see a sort of modification in the um, in the sort of function of the of the terracotta pieces um, that it supports supports plant life and can do other things besides um, in regards to the sort of bioclimactic issues um, uh, as opposed to just being a, a, a sort of cladding element to the facade. Take a drink of water. Next project I'll talk about um, quickly is 512 West 22nd Street, which was a uh, project in which uh, Albany's development engaged Cook Fox in 2014 um, for a 160,000 square foot office building uh, in Chelsea neighborhood of Manhattan that bordered the High Line. And the sort of inspiration of the design that we see here is um, is is kind of twofold. One was um, the, the the neighboring the neighborhood in, this, in the in a few blocks away. You see the Scare Lehigh building um, that was was truly um, you know, what I think of an inspiration for the the massing of the building, um, and as well as the fact that this this uh, project bordered the High Line, um, and so we're taking a sort of biophilic sort of inspiration of the landscape there um, to inform. Um, the 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 sort of um, the, the cuts in the massing and the and the greenery dispersed within there. The project started off with a sort of open mind, um, uh, where the architects were looking at various techniques for the spandrel areas, uh, cladding the spandrel areas, where they looked at um, everywhere from from brick um, to to metal um, to you know projecting um, uh, ceramic pieces, ultimately landing on a um, on a facade system that engaged or that incorporated. Uh, a terracotta, and one that where they wanted to accentuate, at least initially, accentuate the corners of the uh, uh, of the um, uh, inside and outside corners of the of the spandrels by modifying the terracotta in some in some places. And what I'm going to talk to you know while we didn't end up landing on that um, exact process, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the process of how we sort of were were going through designing those that that technique and then the final product. So what we see here is the sort of early sketches that um, were developed by the design team to to uh, um, describe what that spandrel consisted of. And you can see here that um, it's essentially consisted of, that, and at that point, two um, extruded um, terracotta panels um, that, uh, that covered an insulated backup wall. And you know, along the way, we got various uh, input from various um, uh, manufacturers, and, and quite a bit, especially from, from Boston Valley Terracotta. And this is a, a diagram that they helped um, that they supplied for the design team to help inform how that um, that system could could work um, given the the design at the time. So what that consisted of was a series of extrusions. In this case, singular extrusion, not the double extrusions that we saw in the previous slide, but that took took various forms. One, you know, uh, and essentially using a standard clip system would either utilize um, 
uh, straight extrusions, uh, and then various um, twisting or curving in plan um, uh, extrusions to navigate the corners. And then you can see here how those though that that information and that sort of design assist process that we worked with Boston Valley on sort of made its way into the architectural documentation as well, where very similar language for describing the components were utilized in the documents, I believe, at, at DD stage at this time. Um, at that point, you know, there was um, uh, uh, an under, a, a sort of uh, a question of how we would support uh, what would ultimately be uh, turned out to be um, uh, at that time a, a sort of more baguette approach uh, to, to the corners where the, the, the terracotta rain screen opened up to reveal uh, a different wall system beyond. And we were looking at a number of various techniques that, uh, and developing various, various techniques to do that. Um, and uh, in this case, we were looking at, um, you know, a sort of uh, a unitized approach um, that would utilize a, uh, a, a rack with various um, uh, pins that would allow for the adjustability of an extrusion um, through a different setting of that extrusion over the, over the course, um, over, over any given section of, uh, of spandrel. So um, that was, that was the, the, the condition at the time. And you know, we developed the, the documents accordingly. Um, and one of the things that we had to take into account that, at that point is how we're addressing that sort of system behind, that, the insulated wall behind, because now essentially, um, utilizing two two cladding systems, right? One is one is the uh, the, the terracotta system. And then there's the one that avoids you seeing the backup wall of the insulation behind. So that was a really interesting process, and ultimately um, that twisting um, did not did not manifest itself in the in the project for for a number of reasons. But what was really um, fantastic about the process of working with Boston Valley was was the process of developing um, the, the 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 slumping um, of these pieces for these for these radius corners um, on a fairly complex um, uh, extrusion. Right? These were these were sort of non non symmetrical extrusions, um, and what you can see here is that um, in this case uh, of a convex um, cladding um, element. Um, we have the mold shop drawing here, and then actual the, the, the simultaneous um, uh, extrusion piece that would that would be utilizing that mold um, for those pieces. And here you can see the the early stage mock-up that uh, that uh, utilized those that exact technique, where you can see the sort of the beauty and the sort of continuity and the sort of uh, precision that that the the terracotta pieces were able to afford. Um, and the sort of you know which, which speaks to the sort of uh, quality of manufacturing and the and the know-how of the terracotta or the Boston Valley terracotta team to understand how these pieces when they're fired would shrink and ultimately you know you know adjust form in slight in slight uh, dimensions um, but still maintain a high degree of tolerance. And what you can see here um, is just some shots of the final images where um, you can see the sort of the, 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 the quality and almost the seamlessness um, that, that um, wasn't even apparent in the, in the mock-up where the joints become very, uh, almost imperceptible from, a, from, this, from this, the, the highline uh, view. And you can also see this, the, the beginnings of this sort of biophilic design where the plantings on these various terraces were, were, um, were uh, um, installed. Last project I'm going to talk about is the Orange County Museum of Art, which we're currently working on with um, Morphosis. It's a 53,000 square foot um, home, new home for the Orange County Museum of Art, um, and the design began in 2015. Um, you can see from early renderings that the um, design utilized a sort of tiled approach, um, and uh, the, those tiles would take a sort of planar and cur curvilinear format. You can see here the um, the uh, uh, sort of models that, that describe the massing, and then ultimately a description of the of the various facade systems. And what we what we want to highlight here is that what you see in this sort of gray shaded area is is the terracotta system located in in two in two specific areas. What's exciting about this project was that really the design of the terracotta facade was born out of the the ACOL events back in 2017, where where Stan Sue and his team from Morphosis. Um, utilized this, the workshop to develop this concept, um, which if you know of Morphs' designs, they typically um, or quite often use um, uh, metal cladding and glass in a lot of their projects. So this is a first for them, I believe, uh, in the world of terracotta. And you can see here how they were utilizing, you know, 
sections of the design to to create a, a rain screen system that uh, that ultimately they would they would they would uh, they would mock up and they would they would install and and and, and sort of simulate the various cuts um, on a mock up within the within the event that was that proved to be fairly successful in early prototyping for this facade system. Um, you can see in the year later that they took a step further and actually developed the facade system um, in a different a different way that that might actually utilize a different tiling technique and in unitizing the facade um, and um, look uh, using a, a sort of more hexagonal and overlapping tile pattern. Um, but ultimately, this was just a more of a um, an experimental approach that wasn't really um, you know ultimately used in the project. But going back to um, the project itself. You know what we can see here is just a snapshot of a section of that project where of the OCMA project, where it describes the the, the the rain screen system, and utilizing a fairly conventional rain screen attachment approach. Um, but what's unique about this project is the fact that there is so much um, irregularity in the in the geometry of the facade system here, and that in the unitization, uh, unlike what Roberto will speak to, um, uh, is was not really seen as a benefit here um, because of so much uh, irregularity. Um, there was a number of of different um, uh, of uh, panel types, which I'll speak to in a second. But you can see here how we took the geometry initially. And sort of then developed a substructure to su support it that, that the terracotta would ultimately have to navigate. That that analysis of that substructure ultimately made its way into the the design uh, and and sort of documentation of the of that subframe, and that overlay onto the primary skin, which is which is important to understand that how how the deviation between the the pure the pure geometry of the skin and that and that more rough substructure um, would be maintained. And right here, you can see the, the kind of really well-developed geometry, skin geometry of that terracotta, where all the all the models, all the all the panels of terracotta were explicitly modeled. Um, you have here 65,000, sorry, 6,500 panels of uh, of uh, unique panels that um, of 4,500 were about were typical, quote unquote, uh, planar units that are roughly 12 inches by 30 inches, um, and then they were trimmed and formed uh, to a myriad of types. Um, there were 300 mitered curved units, 1,900 curved units, and 1,500 trimmed units, um, resulting in about 30% of the panels, of all the panels being unique. You can see here some of the, the, the documentation that were produced for the construction documents. And something to note here is that all those, mod, all those panels that you saw in the previous image are, are labeled with specific um, uh, um, information to then be able to feed to Boston Valley to create those, those shop drawings and cut sheets. Again, you can see the, the, the typical sort of planar condition, but ultimately what was interesting here to navigate that sort of um, the more irregular areas of the curved, um, uh, 3D curved surface is that we we're proposing a, uh, a, tracks, a mod slightly modified track system that, that allows for adjustability in and out of the page, um, as well as the um, uh, adjustability um, and rotational adjustability to adjust the clips, which was a sort of um, a nice deviation from the traditional approach. You can see here the the, um, the terracotta panels in their uh, sitting alongside um, their their specific molds, um, as well as the cut pieces. You can see here the glaze, which is a really nice um, the, the uh, white glaze on a uh, on a dark body uh, of terracotta, um, and then ultimately what we see here is the um, the, the beginnings of a mock-up, which is currently underway um, uh, in, in, in construction. So that's I'm going to end it there. I'm going to hand it over to Roberto. Um, thank you for for. Uh, for hearing me out, and uh, and I'm um, excited to hear Roberto's take on a more um, larger scale projects and unitization. So, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Taking over. Let me share my screen. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you uh, for having us uh, and uh, me representation of Permacy Lisa to this incredible event. We are very uh, excited to present uh, uh, our take on uh, unitization. I will uh, uh, present uh, basically the one band LP project, which was introduced this morning by Jens Klemper very, in, a, in his very uh, uh, nice presentation. And uh, so my picture will be not at the level that he Issue, but uh, you know we are trying to get into the guts of the facade, and uh, 
and uh, try to explain to you all the complexity, although within a simple, uh, uh, you know, profile, uh, if you will, <coughs> and a unique profile of terracotta involved in this project. Uh, but uh, all the complexity that uh, uh, is related to integrating um, uh, that material in a unitized, uh, pre-assembled, uh, prefabricated uh, curtain wall system. So <coughs> I would like to also briefly introduce our uh, company for the one that uh, are not familiar with us. Uh, we are very quickly, just for five slides, we are a design, engineering, project manager, manufacturing, uh, installation, effort and service uh, company that specializes in uh, um, custom uh, um, uh, complex uh, facade system. Um, we have a present uh, worldwide. I think the only continent where we don't have a, a physical present is Africa. Otherwise, we are um, everywhere else. Uh, we are done job in Africa, but we are not a, uh, an office there. Uh, in North America, we have the headquarters base in Winston, Connecticut, not far from the Boston Valley uh, Terracotta factory, which was the supplier for the one band that we project. And we enjoyed that uh, vicinity, uh, obviously, for a reason that I will explain in a little bit. We have factory production factory in Windsor and Montreal, and we have a design and engineering office uh, in uh, Windsor, Montreal, New York, Miami, and Minneapolis. <clears throat> we have done in uh, our history a number of uh, uh, high-rise buildings and landmark, landmark buildings, for sure. Um, uh, we are uh, strong in a high-rise uh, building in particular. Uh, the one bundle P project that I use here, and actually I can uh, maybe use the laser pointer so you can see better, uh, is the second tallest tower that we will uh, uh, complete in, uh, in New York. Uh, the tallest is the Central Park Tower, South of Central Park, just for 42 feet. Of difference, uh, but that is the tallest uh, uh, commercial building because the Central Park Tower is a residential building. So we are proud to uh, to be part of uh, the history of New York having uh, completed the facade for uh, for this building. And obviously, uh, part uh, uh, Boston Valley was essential to the success of the of the project. So we are a company as an integrated process and management approach uh, to the business. So we like to do assistant, uh, assistance from the early stage of the design and to architectural uh, firms and developers and consultants. Um, we take care of detecting a commercial tender. We do full management. We design engineering in-house. Uh, we have our own testing facility, but we like to use testing facility uh, third party uh, very often and in the States we do it all the time. We have our own quality assurance, quality control uh, uh, department. We take care of production and manufacturing and, uh, and procurement uh, and we do installation uh, by our own and we don't start contracted out. And uh, these days, uh, especially in the last five years, uh, um, very often we are able also to have after sale service to try to maintain the warranty in place for the longest time possible and, uh, uh, and maintain the facade uh, as uh, it's supposed to be. So some experience with job done uh, uh, previously in Terracotta <laughs> in, uh, in uh, New York, we've done City Point uh, Tower 2. Uh, which has uh, uh, quite a bit of uh, opaque area all done with the terracotta material. This is an older project for Memorial Sloan Kedder within the first phase and the smaller second expansion. <coughs> uh, some project in uh, London, the London Wall Place, uh, uh, done uh, uh, with the terracotta GFRC panel, but the majority of uh, uh, terracotta tiles, different shapes and uh, uh, in fully integrated within the unitized curtain wall system. Uh, the one fan court in 2018 also. <clears throat> the Francis uh, Creek Institute in London, uh, um, uh, not a, a big project, but a complex geometry, uh, definitely uh, with a lot of terracotta integration within the facade, as well as the one crown place in, uh, in London. So then let's start looking at the some key facts of the one bundle build. Um, the architect uh, KPF uh, uh, designed this wonderful tower and this morning we understood exactly uh, how and why they decided 
to adopt that shape, uh, that angularity, sloped facade. It's a building that, uh, with the exception of a small facade at the podium, which uh, has a uh, uh, certain level as a setback, uh, all the remaining facade of the entire building are slightly sloped, few degrees only, and every facade has a different degree of slope. Uh, we have uh, uh, done this job for Elsel Green, which is a realtor that is, uh, owns uh, uh, quite a few buildings in the Midtown area, particularly. As we said, this tower uh, is sitting next to the Grand Central Station. <clears throat> construction management was handled by Heinz, and the general contractor was Fishman Construction, and our Cook and World Consultant uh, was Vidari, uh, Vidaris. Um, Total square footage area is 735,000 square feet, so that definitely a large uh, project. I will go into uh, more key uh, figures later on <coughs> in the presentation, but just to give you some on the geometry, uh, is uh, 103,001 uh, uh, feet high and uh, 100 feet high um, higher with a with a spire. Uh, is a 77 story tall. I think if you add also the upper portion, the screen wall and the snorkel, you are having 93 uh, really floors more or less. Um, we see a total of 8,743 facade units and uh, 36,145 uh, terracotta tiles. Uh, not all the same shape, uh, not all the same size actually. Uh, many different sizes, but uh, uh, one shape uh, only. <clears throat> so let's see uh, some of the details of the, of the of the facade. This is a typical horizontal section at the spandrel level. Uh, I try to color uh, different materials so to give you a better understanding. So obviously in orange here is the terracotta uh, tile. As a, this is a scallop shape, uh, which show later on a little bit more the geometry. In blue are all the aluminum component, male and female malleons of the unitized curtain wall system. Um, in green here are aluminum extrusion, uh, intermediate horizontal, actually diagonal, I should say, the uh, extrusion onto which the terracotta tile is, uh, is, uh, is sitting. And uh, this uh, uh, system of gasket, and actually, let me do this maybe so you can see better. Uh, this is the most gasket around the perimeter of the terracotta. Uh, we had designed it not only to separate the terracotta from the aluminum, but also thinking about the uh, deliveries of the terracotta of the pre-assembled uh, units uh, with the terracotta uh, as part of it and uh, uh, to try to you know, re reduce as much as possible uh, vibration and potential breakages uh, uh, during transportation. I will get into this a little bit more in detail later on, showing you some picture of what happened in some cases. So the terracotta um, panel is at the spandrel, at every spandrel level, and uh, it is, uh, this is the top of the unit, there's a transition between the top of the unit and the unit uh, above. Uh, this is a curtain wall system, so every unit is uh, uh, hanging uh, from the upper floor, and this is the bottom of the unit, and is hanging uh, through uh, anchor that are basically attached to the, to the edge of the slab, basically, so the group of anchors. And this is a typical, really vertical section in the middle of the, of the, <coughs> of the spandrel panel. Uh, the uh, interstory deflection is taken in this uh, excursion space that we have here, and uh, I can also, I think, uh, sorry, do that, right? You see here, <coughs> there is this space that is allowed for the interstory movement, the thermal expansion, tolerances of uh, production and, uh, and installation. And then we have obviously the uh, the spandrel that in this case has been treated as a rain screen cladding. So we allow air and water to pass the, the first barrier. Uh, and also because the facade um, is supposed to be uh, uh, for up to a certain level uh, designed to withstand the uh, blast load. Uh, so it's a protective design. <coughs> we, we treated the terracotta as a uh, a sacrificial material. Basically, the full load, the blast and wind, will be taken by this uh, galvanized insulated sandwich back panel, 
which is obviously taking the, the load, but also is the uh, final barrier uh, to air and water, basically. Uh, <coughs> so if you see in the middle, you see here yeah, the full uh, uh, shape of the scallop. Uh, it's approximately from uh, bottom to top 13 inches, uh, 116, and uh, from uh, the tip uh, to the tip, uh, um, you know, just considering the valley, uh, 12 inches. And there's a, a radius of 12 inches uh, in terms of geometry. Obviously, <coughs> uh, we had to deal with the tolerances of production. I will explain a little bit how we, we did all that. So the geometry of the building, as I said, being all the facade slope, created uh, a number of uh, complexity in terms of uh, modulation of the uh, curtain wall units and, uh, and geometry of the building in, uh, itself. In particular, we took the decision to uh, design uh, fully assembled corners. Um, so we didn't use a split mallion in the corner, but we deliver a fully assembled unit. And because of the slope, uh, basically uh, every corner units uh, resulted to be difficult, different from floor to floor. So every single uh, uh, tile, and we have, uh, as you see here also for the previous slide, there are also only basically three basic uh, uh, typologies, right? The, the triangular top, triangular bottom, the A and C, and the typical uh, uh, in the middle. Sometimes it's a double, sometimes these are four rows. Uh, at the very top of the building, uh, we use only the triangular top and bottom. <clears throat> but every unit has uh, this uh, horizontal band of terracotta um, as part of the, the assembly of the unit. So again, for the production standpoint, the Boston Valley, at the end of the day, they had to deal with one shape of and then we created these subfamilies, just cutting that uh, uh, extrusion, terracotta extrusion, into uh, these uh, triangular, and sometimes we have also irregular, like trapezoidal uh, uh, shapes, uh, <coughs> but uh, nothing more than that. We, we worked and we played with the cavities uh, of the tile to be able to, uh, to grab, basically, the uh, the terracotta once uh, uh, that uh, that tile was cut uh, to cut it from uh, from at this level right with uh, using the edge uh, the perimeter extrusion so we have uh, basically created this extrusion which is a trim around the terracotta frame which uh, had also this leg that sometimes was notched so we not continue it was continuous but we notch it and the one that was remaining was notched out, was not notched out, uh, was basically engaging the, the cavity, the remaining cavity after the cut of, uh, of the tiles at the, along the perimeter. Uh, at the bottom, instead, <coughs> we have created a, a number of uh, extrusion, in particular this red colored one here, which has, uh, uh, is a retaining clip. It's not a continuous extrusion. Uh, uh, clip that are four inches long and we put it so many depending from like the length of the of the tiles. Um, the, this is the intermediate diagonal that I was uh, uh, showing before in the horizontal section and then this in yellow is a uh, just an aesthetic uh, snap-on clip uh, to to give a, a nice uh, uh, aesthetic uh, transition from uh, uh, tile to tile basically in, the, in this joint. So that's uh, um, uh, how we have uh, uh, attached the, the, the unit in the, at the perimeter. In the, in the middle, obviously, at the bottom, the unit uh, is simply sitting on the uh, diagonal uh, extrusion. And then the top, of course, is uh, retained by the clip that I mentioned before. This clip is a clip that uh, is in aluminum and is a slide into uh, this slot. Uh, there are uh, extruded uh, uh, in the intermediate uh, diagonal. <clears throat> we have machined the intermediate diagonal in a certain way that in case of replacement, we can uh, 
slide those clips in that position, uh, collapse them and uh, get this uh, tile free for uh, uh, replacement. And I will show you that in a, in a, in a second. As part of the playing with the geometry, we had to deal also with large modules uh, up to 10 foot wide when the typical was five foot. And, uh, and because of that, obviously, we couldn't handle the, the length of the, of the tile in, in one piece. So we had to create a, a breaking point, a seam line. And we joined basically two terracotta uh, tiles uh, using a, a back uh, um, standard steel plate bolted uh, from the back. These large tiles, 10 modules, we did the assembly of the terracotta tiles in our factory in Connecticut because we didn't feel comfortable and that was agreed by Boston Valley to ship these large, long uh, tiles. Um, we were afraid of breakage during transportation. Although we have all um, less than 200 pieces to handle this way, but it was still a concern. For the uh, the, 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 the splice condition that were more reasonable in length, which was just a, a little appendix to, to achieve the uh, full modularity of the, of the, especially at the corner this was happening. We used the same system, a splice, but this splice this time was fully assembled by Boston Valley, packed, created and shipped it to us for the uh, installation onto the unit. <coughs> So, if we look at uh, again at the, at the system I already explained how we have attached, these are basically uh, the one, two, and three extrusion. Uh, we handle the joint between the terracotta and we handle the, the perimeter uh, just with the trim around. In terms of weight that we have to deal with, uh, the tile A, so the triangular, were more or less 30 pounds weight, so not very heavy. Um, the, the, the standard, I would say, tile. Uh, 60 pound, the, uh, the C tiles at the bottom triangle was obviously 30 pounds as well. Uh, from each terracotta tile, once we cut it uh, along the diagonal, we were basically able to use the two pieces uh, to handle the top and bottom mostly. So there was a lot of uh, 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 mini minimum waste material, almost zero really. Uh, we use uh, all of it. For the 10 foot module, we were reaching up to 90 pounds of, uh, of weight of, uh, of, uh, of a tile. This is an important information because obviously, um, as part of the design, especially when you have to with, deal with terracotta or stone in general, uh, you need all, all, always to think about uh, a design that is friendly enough uh, to allow you to um, replace uh, uh, tiles individually rather than, uh, uh, than in um, dismantling the whole, the whole panel. To do that, uh, basically, <coughs> we have uh, created that, uh, a procedure, almost uh, an explanation to go step by step, which was basically important uh, for our installer also to, to follow in case at the last minute after the installation there was some breakage that was uh, um, occurring. So obviously we need, uh, the idea was to apply a protective film uh, to the broken tile to guarantee the integrity during the replacement and then uh, uh, snap off the trim which was quite easy. Uh, these uh, um, screw here in the middle is a nothing walking screw to uh, avoid this trim because it's sitting in the diagonal to uh, slide eventually uh, if it's not fully engaged uh, to prevent that uh, so it's a mechanical retainment uh, is a redundant way to approach the design uh, and conservative way to be safe uh, you don't want to have these pieces flying uh, all over new york uh, in a windy day because they just simply snap off by themselves right and um and so you remove this, the, the, the two trim at the top and bottom. You apply the film first, remove the trim. The second, you have to remove the anti walking screw. Uh, after that, you are able to reach the screw that is fixing the red extrusion that I called it before, that is the clip retaining the, uh, the tile. When you lose that up, uh, then you can slide it in that uh, special point of the of the of the unit where we have created uh, a particular machining to uh, uh, to drop and collapse those clips 
at that point the the unit uh, uh, the tile is basically free to come out uh, we need to do this rotation and that's the reason why we need to remove uh, the the bottom trim here because otherwise we were not able to to do that at that point also the bottom uh, tile uh, somehow is semi free because it doesn't have a, a portion of the trim so i will show you in a moment what we have created to guarantee the integrity while we are doing this operation but the beauty of this is that we are basically touching really one tile we are not moving uh, removing every pieces to just to remove one piece and that's the reason why we have decided to do an assembly this way rather than have a spandrel panel with terracotta as a cassette system so as a prefabricated subunit if you will to be attached to the main uh, curtain wall frame uh, after the fact. Doing that was more probably convenient by the production standpoint because we had uh, more flexibility in receiving the material. Uh, even later, we had more buffer uh, between that and the uh, line of production. So we took our risk because I think we felt more comfortable for the maintenance and replacement to go ahead with the design that was basically seeing the terracotta completely assembled onto the units along the conveyor. <clears throat> After we uh, put the new tile, the replacement tile, then we can reapply the clips, uh, screw them up and uh, uh, put the anti wogging uh, screw again and then uh, uh, apply uh, <coughs> uh, the trim, uh, uh, aesthetic trim again. So this is the apparatus that we have uh, uh, generated just to <coughs> be able to maintain in place the tile below uh, the one that we are uh, replacing basically. is a, is a number of um, of uh, arm, telescopic uh, uh, arms here. Uh, with these uh, tools that can enter into the joint in the vertical position. Again, let me zoom in here. Enter the joint in the vertical position when enter into the joint of the units, we rotate it 90 degree and we engage uh, into the mallion basically. Uh, in uh, some of those into the window washing truck mallion, some of those into the regular mallion. As you can see here on the next slide, basically you have uh, you have uh, the, the idea. That's, uh, that's the telescopic uh, arm. This is the device that goes inside and once it's already at 90 degree, it's gonna be fully engaged onto this, that is the window washing truck in this particular case. In this other, uh, this other mallion here, instead as a, a regular uh, mallion, no window washing truck, but uh, this uh, device is able to engage all, all onto that as well. <coughs> So this uh, in vertical section allow us to have uh, this uh, device in place holding the tile below the one that we are replacing or above the one that we are replacing, just to, uh, for safety reasons. <clears throat> so all the speech that I had on the geometry and the corner being one different from the other, every floor and so on and so forth. But if you look at the building, if you look at the tower, you see a massive tower, 735,000 square feet. Uh, a lot of repetition, you think. In reality, we call it configurations. Configuration means a, a curtain wall type that may be identical to another, but just because of dimension, or just because of uh, having the window washing truck instead of not being with the window washing truck or things of this nature, is basically different in nature from uh, its sister unit, let's say, and for that reason, as his own uh, fabrication drawings, completely different, different accessories and so on. So in that building overall, we have 8,743 uh, curtain wall units in total. But we have also 1,083 configuration, which means uh, different families of units, just for the dash. And that is a bigger repercussion in the production of the title. Roberto, uh, there's yeah. just five minutes left. Yes, thank um, you. So you have an eight to one uh, ratio of, uh, of things. So obviously we went through the visual mock-up as well. Uh, this is a picture of one of the two visual mock-up. You see how the terracotta change from colors from, um, from uh, uh, just an hour and a half, two hours different. This was a Southwest exposition. 
We did a, a performance test mock-up as well as freezing to uh, cycles so to monitor uh, the interaction between the terracotta, the aluminum clips, the frames, and, and so on. And just to show you uh, the, the brain spinning uh, cladding of the, of the unit, you see the dynamic uh, uh, other test that we've done the water was behind the terracotta and the bone going to be lift up eventually uh, by the speed of the, of, of the wind. So the collaboration of Boston Valley was great. This is a, a flow chart the typical that Boston Valley has. And the aluminum portion was handled by us, so it was not really uh, anything that received, we received from them uh, with aluminum extrusion attached to it. This is the geometry of the profile. This morning James uh, showed it to us already. And uh, we created a dedicated manual QC. Uh, we were there for the first month, month and a half with our own uh, uh, um, uh, people. And then we had a visit, a custom visit every week to Boston Valley facility and they were following a stringent uh, quality control and manager. This is a table that we have basically uh, synthesized with a conversion chart from Imperial to metric for simplicity of measurement and control of all, uh, all the parts. Warpage, length, straightness, diagonal, height, height, and uh, uh, vertical flatness was uh, uh, all the uh, th things that we have checked uh, with Boston Valley on top of the colors. These are a sample of all the uh, samples that we have produced along the way. <clears throat> uh, we have created a, a calibrated table with a uh, um, uh, gauge uh, to check the, the cutting uh, that they were done with the laser guided. Uh, computer uh, control uh, with source. Um, obviously, we have uh, checked uh, uh, blur, uh, indent, blemishes, the color. This is the deposition of the glaze uh, in the valley, as the architect uh, uh, asked. And also, the consistency of color was important. We decided how to pack it to try to minimize the, the breakages. And ultimately, the crates were shrink wrap, sent it to us very compact so not too many vibration and we didn't have literally almost zero breakages for material received from them these are the number of pieces of all the family that they had so the majority as you see were standard and triangular with a, a few or irregular and then the extended as i explained before some picture of the production line these are the diagonal extrusion that i uh, showed you they were colored in green before before the terracotta tile were installed these are the clips. Rebecca, we will need to conclude. Yes, I'm almost done. I am just picture I will be yeah. very fast. And this is the edge uh, uh, with a touch up instead of glaze uh, uh, that was done. This is the line of the conveyors and the fully assembled uh, corner. Uh, we had a 0.85% of breakages, very low uh, after all that. And the installation uh, was done uh, using our own equipment. Uh, we start from the bottom up, as you see, and we maintain uh, distance uh, uh, and the same pace of the other construction. These are some breakages that we had for transportation of the unit to the site, unfortunately, but it was very minimum. This is one of the extensions that broke as well. And this is what just impacted uh, by other trades. Uh, so in, on site, despite all those breakages that I show, we have only 0.30% of, uh, of breakage. Some picture of uh, how we progress on this installation. You see the separation uh, from the uh, steel structure, fireproofing, uh, and concrete that was always maintained as, uh, as possible, which means that we receive material on time. This is one of the gorgeous day, day days in New York. And uh, you see, we have uh, basically reached the top uh, of the facade uh, on uh, August 7th. Uh, this is the last unit that was installed uh, five days ago. And this is a picture of uh, that accomplishment that we have done. Uh, so the building is completed with the exception of 350 units and needs to be installed the uh, material uh, hoist. And that's uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you, Roberto. Um, uh, we, we have gone a little bit over our time, and so I think it'll be a little bit tough maybe uh, to, to get any questions in. Uh, the, I think many of the questions were really tied to this question of 
uh, flexibility and removable uh, of, uh, of of the units from 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 the framing systems. Uh, so what we'll try to do is, if there are any any more questions, please do just put them in the chat, and we'll pass them on to both Roberto um, uh, and Eric, uh, so that we can maintain our time uh, as there are uh, two or three more three more panels to go. Uh, Eric and Roberto, thank you very much. Those are very enlightening talks. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Omar.